Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome back to Synth Stuff. This is episode two of the Roland Juno 106 Repair and Restoration Guide. We're going to take this Juno 106 right here. We're going to take it apart, fix it, make it better than new. Coming up next. I got a lot of response from people on the uh, episode one. I guess a lot of people have these sitting at home and they're broken or not working quite right. And I guess they're excited because I'm doing this series that shows how I'm going to fix this one and make it better than new. So uh, yeah, it's generated a lot of interest. So we're gonna start today by opening the synth up, taking all the boards out, uh, take key bat out, basically disassemble it, and then uh, we'll go from there. We might even get to the voice chips today. We'll see. We'll see what we find once we get inside. To open up the uh, Juno 106 is super simple. If you have a look at the end cheeks, there is several screws in here. There's two screws at the top on each side. Just remove those two screws on each side. And to do that, I use my Vessel JIS screwdriver because Synthesizers made in Japan have JIS screws, which is Japanese industrial standard. So you want to use a Japanese industrial screwdriver to remove them because a Phillips screwdriver doesn't fit JIS screwdriver or screws properly. Uh, a JIS driver will work on Phillips screws okay, but the other, the reverse is not true. So get yourself a vessel driver. These are really the nicest uh, screwdrivers I've ever owned. I will put a link to them in the description below. And as always, whenever I remove fasteners from something, I will put them in a Ziploc bag and write what they're for, because you never know. You know, you might be planning just to take this apart for a day and get everything done, but what if you find out there's a part inside that is broken that takes you six weeks to find, and by then you've forgotten what fastener goes where. Believe me, it happens. So label your fasteners. All right, once we've removed those four screws, two from each side, we just lift up the lid and we get to see the wonders inside. All right, so what we have inside the Juno 106, here is the socket that I installed, the IEC socket. Um, and then the power, uh, fuse, power transformer, power supply. Here is the uh, main CPU board. Here is the secondary, uh, this is the voice board with the uh, secondary CPU. Up here we have the jack board and then a control board up here, MIDI control board over here. Um, as I'm looking at this, we do have the portamento or the, uh, uh, this quadrant here that has portamento and bender that will come out as well. So all of these boards are going to come out of the synthesizer because we're going to be doing something to all of them. The jack board we will be taking out because there's a little pot back here that needs to be cleaned as well as a switch and all those jacks are going to get cleaned. This control board is going to come out because we're going to remove all of the controls and replace them with new ones. The voice board is going to come out because as part of the Kiwi 6 upgrade, we have to pull out this CPU. We have to desolder that CPU and replace it. And then, of course, we have the, the six voice and filter chips, uh, which are going to be coming out and being replaced with the analog renaissance. Uh, voice and filter chips. Here we have the main CPU board. This will be going away. This is going to become uh, replaced with the original Kiwi 6 board. And then the power supply. We're going to be taking this out and examining uh, the power transistors, the regulators, and making sure that the solder joints are good. And uh, we'll also have a look at that uh, linear regulator chip and replacing that as well. The key bed itself is going to come out because uh, we're going to replace the contacts and also clean it. Unfortunately for this keyboard, it means in order to do that, we have to remove every single one of these keys. And in order to do that, we have to remove every single one of these springs. And worse, we have to reinstall every single one of these springs. I'm really not looking forward to that, but hey, it's, we've got to do what we've got to do. As you can see, the bottom of the Juno 106 is wood. Everything is just screwed into the wood. So um, it's it's uh, even if you're putting in the new Kiwi 6 board, you can just screw it right down in there and it's good. 
The first thing we're going to do now that we have this open is document. So I'm going to take my, my cell phone here and I'm going to take pictures of everything. Uh, I'm particularly interested in wiring bundles and connectors where everything goes, where everything plugs in, because again, it might be weeks before this goes back together and we may not remember where all these connectors go. So doing this has saved me more times than I can remember. Make sure we get the portamento and bender section. And there are some connectors and things down here and the bundle going up there. Get pictures of that. And let's just get a close up of all these here. All right, let's remove the key bed. So the key bed has several screws on the top holding it in as well as on the bottom. So the key bed on the top has these three machine screws with washers. And on the bottom, it has these four black machine screws, which are a, a, look like a pan head. And that we will stick in our key bed bag. Now the key bed should be able to just to lift free except for the wiring. So we have to clip these uh, wire ties. And here are two keyboard leads, so we will disconnect these both from the CPU board. So these are not glued in place, but they have been on here for 40 years, so they will take a little bit of gentle effort to remove. And there we have our key bed. Doesn't look too bad. Felt looks to be in decent shape. A little bit of dirt and dust and hair, but that's to be expected. Tiny bit of corrosion right there, but uh, overall looks to be in good shape. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is the power supply. Now these boards, you'll notice, are using wood screws because they're actually screwed directly into the wood base. You'll notice that the, uh, the wire coming from the transformer into the power supply is hard soldered in place. There's no connector to remove. So what we're going to be doing to the power supply, we'll do, do to it while it's in the case. And there's just a little cable stay there that I will remove to give us a little more free play. And you see what I'm doing here? I will often, when I remove a screw like this, I'll just put it back in loosely where it came from because that gives me an indication of exactly where it came from. Okay, so the power supply has this large heat sink on it, which is held in place with this screw right here. There's the heat sink and there is our power supply. So here we can see the regulator chip that I'm going to pull out and replace. And then we've got the three power transistors. We're just going to resolder those. We've got a couple of variable resistors for doing calibration. And if we turn it over, we can see here's where we're going to have to desolder those chips. And here's those uh, three power transistors where we're going to resolder. And this one actually looks kind of iffy. I don't know if that one's been replaced or what's going on with that. That is a 7805. Definitely looks like it's been replaced to me. Yeah, I can see flux on top of the silk screen there. So somebody's replaced that 7805 before, which makes sense because it does not look like these older chips here. This is a more modern 7805 with a, with a metal back to it. Uh, we'll check that. I've got tons of 7805s if it's bad, um, but we'll check the, uh, the chips and the soldering. And then we'll put this back in and power it up and do the calibration adjustments on it. Make sure it's good before we go any further, because we're definitely not going to be uh, powering this up until I know the power supply is, is absolutely perfect, because the last thing I want to do is blow up stuff downstream. So let me go get my soldering gear and we'll get to work on that power supply. The uh, 
desolderer is at temperature, so let's get to work desoldering this chip. And just like that, we should be able to pop that out. There we go. So there is the M. See if you can get that on there. M5230L, the original Mitsubishi. And I just got uh, new ones off eBay. Which you, you, I got two of them. They charged me fifteen dollars for two. So that's a not too too bad for low quantity parts. As you can see, it's also a Mitsubishi 5230L. Um, no it's not. It's a 5220L and I didn't notice that when I was actually taking it out of the package, which set me up for all kinds of problems as you will see shortly. I'll insert the new one. Once the soldering iron has gotten up to temperature. All right, looks good. Now while we're at it, we're gonna just heat up and, and reflow the uh, solder terminals on these three regulator chips. What happens over time is that these transistors will heat up and cool off and heat up and cool off over and over and over again. And eventually the solder on here will actually crack and uh, they'll lose contact. So just by heating them up and applying just a little bit more extra solder on there, it helps prevent that from happening. Yeah, I can definitely tell someone replaced this uh, 7805 because they didn't trim the leads off properly when they installed it. So I will just do that right now. Before we re reinstall that uh, heat sink, uh, it is dusty, so I'm gonna clean it using some of my magic spray cleaner polish from Honda. Uh, I have actually made another video about this. This is my secret weapon for cleaning since uh, it, I will put a link to that video instead of trying to talk about it again. I'll put a link both to the actual cleaner as well as the video where I, I talk about why I use it and demonstrate just how well it works on. Well, it's meant for motorcycles and it does work really well on motorcycles, but it works amazingly well on old synthesizers. Okay, so I've got this plugged back in. There's lethal voltages right there, so we're not gonna touch that. We will switch it on. No smoke comes out, that's a good sign. And we should now be able to use the service manual instructions to go through the power supply to check the test points. So here's our ground here. And the first one is to check R10 Mark TP2. Oops, backwards, we'll put negative in ground. And we're seeing 5.0 volts, 5.02. That is not adjustable, that is coming off the 7805. So if we weren't seeing anything other than five volts, then we would have to replace that 7805. Okay, next, we're going to connect it to DP or D1, which is TP1. And I don't see, there it is right there. So let's measure that. And we're seeing minus 21. That is not what we should be seeing. We should be seeing minus 15. So that is way out of spec. So to fix that, we're gonna adjust uh, VR1 right there. 21 volts. And I'm just gonna turn this pot right here. And it does not seem to be having any effect whatsoever. A few moments later. So here's where we stand um, testing this five volt point here. I got that adjusted to 4.997. That's pretty close. Uh, however, the minus 15 is showing minus 21. 
and this 5 volt which is coming off the 7805 that's 5.0 that's fine and then this uh, plus 15 here where's my ground is showing plus 21 and a half um, adjusting these did not make any difference um, so we're gonna have to do some diagnosis diagnosis work on this board I'm glad I did this beforehand before plugging it in because sending 21 volts rather than 15 down to all those other boards would have been a very bad day so I've uh, printed out a couple pages from the service manual I got the board with the layout and then I got the schematic so I'm gonna have to go through the schematic figure out how it was designed trace the uh, the power flow um, and then basically what I'll do is I'll, I'll you know the input is here so I know there's uh, however many volts, 20, probably 24 volts AC on right here. Trace it through the rectifier and then it's in DC and just basically work my way through the circuit and find out where the problem is occurring and uh, where it's falling down. And uh, well, that's about it for right now. So I will come back when I have a update. An hour and a half has gone by. I've been sitting here scratching my head and had this thing apart and done all kinds of testing on it to uh, trace voltages through and and what i was seeing just wasn't making sense i thought at first maybe the two power transistors would be were gone but that doesn't make sense that both of them would be gone so then i i thought well it's almost like this regulator is sending the wrong voltages back to the base of these two transistors causing them to, I mean, it's almost like the feedback loop is incorrect. Um, so then I started measuring voltages and, and what I was seeing coming out of the regular just wasn't make any sense at all. It didn't make sense. I couldn't understand it. So I, I got the data sheet for the regulator and I started going through all the different um, uh, methods that you can set up for, for the feedback. And I'm like trying to reconcile what I see here and how they've actually used it here and so okay now i can understand what they've actually done here and i've measured voltages and i'm like it's still not right what's coming out of here is totally wrong i thought okay the only thing it can be is this regulator is bad so then i looked and they sent me two so i got it from this this ebay uh place called active parts and they actually they actually sent me two for uh 14.95 and you can see i got to uh, 5230s and I thought well maybe maybe it's the one is bad and the other one will be good so then I had a look at the other one and I uh, you know just to make sure that it, it looked good and I had a look at it and it says M5220 L wait a second this should be an M5230L, not an M5220L. So then I had a look at what I just soldered into the, uh, the uh, circuit there, and sure enough, it's a 5220 as well. They sent me the wrong friggin' chip. So I looked up to see what an M52, what this M5220 is, and it's an op amp. Which, so obviously that's not going to work as a voltage regulator. So I have ordered new chips new 5230s and uh, i guess they will arrive sometime later this week so we'll set aside the uh, power supply board for now and instead we will start removing the other boards so that we can get to work on those well that was a frustrating waste of an hour and a half for a stupid reason and i should have checked the chip before i soldered it in i just assumed that what they what it said on the package was what was going to be inside the package but never assume i like how roland used these uh these string looms that's a that's a real lost art you don't really see that being done anymore So there's our CPU board that we, uh, well, the main CPU board that we won't be using anymore. And it looks like that might be static RAM. There's our CPU. And then we have a whole bunch of, uh, looks like multiplexers. We'll set this aside and that'll be going off to Centaur. I'm now fully grounded. I have my static strap on. Uh, these are not just 
a strap that connects you to ground, there's actually a resistor in there because if it's connected to ground and then you touch something over here that's 110 volts, guess what? You complete the circuit right through your chest and game over lights out. So instead this has a, a resistor so it's, it's enough that it drains off the static but not so much connection to ground that you actually electrocute yourself if you accidentally touch something. So it's very important to use something like that. So now that I'm suitably de-staticized, I will take out the Kiwi 106 board. And there it is in all its glory. And that basically, with that little tiny chip right there is the entire system, memory, MIDI, uh, sequencers, uh, RAM, ROM, everything. Everything is crammed right into there. And then this actually, it actually takes the place of both CPUs because you, dis you desolder this CPU and it also performs the function of that CPU and the original CPU. So we will just put this in place here and screw it down. Here are the two connectors for the key bed. As you can see, these wires, these bundles are pretty much bent in place. And so the connectors kind of line up and, and are exactly where you expect them to be to connect onto the various connectors. So yeah, I don't have to figure out what goes where because as long as there's a connector there and it's the, got the right number of pins and it's pretty close to where it's supposed to be, you know that's the one that it, you put it onto. And of course these two are identical, so which one is which? I believe it's like that, but I'm just gonna go refer to my cell phone picture that I took earlier. And it is the orange, red, brown on the bottom. So I actually had it backwards. So that one goes there and this one goes here. See, and that's what pictures are for. Okay, so the Kiwi 106 board is in. The power supply we'll deal with when we deal with it. Next is the, uh, well, let's get the, the portamento board with, it, with the bender in it. That is not a connector, that is soldered in place. So we'll just have to, uh, hmm, interesting. See what they've done here is they've they soldered that right on there. So it doesn't actually come undone. It does at this end, but that means you have to undo this cable loom, which I guess we can undo this. So I actually had to end up just pulling these connectors off the voice board and these two connectors off the CPU board because this wiring loom is permanently connected to the uh, portamento board. Oops, there's my screws. So we'll desolder these potentiometers in here. We'll take this board out and we'll do that at the bench because we can clean it up and do it a lot easier there. Next, we'll do the voice board. This is the heart and soul of the Juno 106. This is where all the magic happens. And there is basically the Juno 106 right there. This is the, the main voice board. You can see the, the voice chips, the filter chips all the pots used to do the calibration. This is the secondary CPU right here that we will have to desolder. And that's quite a job of desoldering. I wouldn't want to do that without a desoldering pump. If you look on here, the traces on this board are microscopic. They're hair thin. And all it takes is just lifting one of these things just a little bit and you've caused 
uh, almost impossible to repair damage. You need a microscope to repair. So you really, really want to be careful desoldering these because you really don't want to lift one of those traces. And it's a double-sided board. So especially on the top side where you have these traces where if you haven't completely desoldered one of these pins and you pull it up, you can very easily pull one of these pads up, which then pulls up a trace and uh, damages this board probably, uh, well, I don't want to say ir irreparably, but it's, it's serious, serious damage. So we have to be very careful doing this upgrade. This is not the kind of upgrade that I would have uh, inexperienced people do. Three days later. Okay, so we've got more or less a take two on the power supply. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this video that you should always put your screws away because you have no idea how long it's gonna take and what problems you might encounter. So the problem I encountered was that uh, the replacement regulator I got was not a regulator. It was a, uh, they sent me a 5220, which is an op amp. So when I put it in the power supply, obviously the power supply did not work. So I did get some 5230s and I've soldered one in there in place of the 5220, which I removed and threw away. So now let's power it up and see if the smoke comes out. Good, that's a good start. Uh, I did go through a lot of uh, the circuit to try and diagnose this issue. Um, in doing so, I actually learned quite a bit about this power supply. It's actually two power, separate power supplies. There's a digital power supply and there's an analog power supply. So it's two power supplies in one. The 7805 is the power supply regulator for the digital side of the house. And then, um, this uh, 5330 along with these two transistors is the analog side, which has quite a few different voltages it produces. Uh, this, ow, ow, son of a Ugh. By the way, don't touch a transformer when uh, the power is on because um, that's 120 volts. That really hurts. Uh, so I'm always talking about how you should be careful about when you're doing this kind of work because there's lethal voltages and uh, yeah, that's why. Don't do what I just did. Anyway, so there's 15 plus and minus 15 volts and plus five volts and plus nine volts uh, for the analog side of the house and then plus five volts for the digital side. So let's calibrate this power supply now. And we should be testing. Uh, there's a few different places we can test. So the first thing we're gonna do is test point two and VR2. So test point two, no, I know we did this already once, but now I'm doing it again. It's been a few days, so I gotta find these test points again. There it is, test point two against ground. We should be seeing five volts. Oh, that's so nice to see. We're pretty close. 4.98, so we'll just VR2 to get it to five volts. That's what I was hoping to see before. Five volts. So that's pretty close. Four, that's about good. And then we will move to test point one and we want to get uh, minus 15 volts against ground. And we are at minus 16, so we'll adjust that. 15 volts. Is our 15 volt, and there is no other adjustment for that, so we're 0.7 volts high. I guess that's uh, as good as we're going to get it. We will check their 7805. I'm sure it's going to be fine that uh, it's going to be locked at 5 volts out, which it is. That's non adjustable. 7805 is just a 5 volt regulator. Okay, so our power supply is good. The other thing I thought we'd get done today is uh, to take this key bed apart and clean it out. Wow, it's pretty nasty. Hair and dust and crud. So what we have to do first is there's this plastic strip. It's kind of a, a clear plastic adhe adhesive strip that's stuck to the back and it is the key retention strip. 
uh, it prevents the keys from being removed from the, the synthesizer. And there we go. We want to just peel it up. And yeah, the adhesive on this is shot. This is 40 year old adhesive. So I'm going to have to put a new adhesive on this when I, re when I replace it, unfortunately. Normally, the idea is that when you remove this adhesive, um, it stays tacky. So when you want to put it back, it just sticks right back in place. But uh, as I found with the uh, JD800 as well, it, it, it doesn't work that way. The adhesive just dries up and stops working. So we'll have to put a new adhesive on this when we're going to replace this piece, which isn't the end of the world. So here's that retention strip. We'll just put this off to the side. And now to remove these keys, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of these little springs uh, that have to be undone. And they have to be undone one at a time and without losing any of them. You wanna put your, your finger on top of them and make sure that they, they, there, just like that. So basically just pull the back, put your finger on the top so they don't go flying, pull the back off and then put the spring aside. And we will do that for every spring on this keyboard. When I have all the springs done, I like to put them in a little case like that so I can't lose them. So now that we've removed all the springs, taking a key off is pretty easy. So all you need to do is push the key a little bit to the front and it just pops right out and then end off. And there is our key. You can see these are pretty grimy and filthy. They do need some cleaning. There we can see it's actually in, I mean, apart from being absolutely filthy, it's in pretty decent condition. So we are going to replace all these rubber contacts. So we'll pull these up. So looking at this whole keyboard, it's really odd the, uh, the strips, how they went on. So we've got one here that I think is 13, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So we have 13, and then we have 12, and then we have 7, then we have 5, then we have 12 and 12. And so we just have to remember that's the order that they go in. I'm going to put these down here for the moment so I don't forget. I'm going to now go into the other room and wash this off with some uh, isopropyl alcohol and uh, a lint-free cloth, and I'll blow the dust off it as well. All right, so I've cleaned off the board and all the contacts with copious amounts of isopropyl alcohol, and now we can get the new contacts ready to install. As you can see, they're, they're pretty much the same as the old ones, just a different color. So we just want to make sure we have the right ones going into the right places with the right number of contacts. So when you want to push these in, first off, you don't want to touch the, the black carbon contacts on there. You're just going to take a, a safety or a paper clip, just push it into the hole and use it to push the piece into the key bed. So you don't want to touch either those contacts or the contacts that you've just cleaned on the board because you don't want oils from your fingers getting on there. So you just push I don't know if you can actually see that, but... Well, for whatever reason, my camera just stopped partway through that. But uh, you, as you can see, I've, I've put these all in. You just have to make sure that 
they do go in only one way. That if you try to put them the wrong way around, you'll, you'll know because the holes won't line up. So basically just lay them in. Uh, as you, as you go, just gently push in the holes with your paper clip to, to seat them. Uh, make sure you don't have any dust or, or, or stuff or oil from your fingers in there and uh, gently just put them all back into place just like that. All right, we'll put this aside. The next thing we're going to do is clean the keys. This is a tedious process because I do them one by one and I use my spray cleaner and polish for this. This is the Honda spray cleaner and polish that I've talked about in several different videos. In fact, I think I have just a entire video all about this stuff. I will put a link to this in the description as well as a link to the video where I talk about this and why I use it and why you should as well. Uh, I've had so much positive response from people who have used this as well and just said it's the greatest thing ever, which I already knew, which is why I told you about it. All right, so I will go clean these keys and come back in a moment. That was nasty. All right, so I sprayed each one of these keys down with the, uh, the spray cleaner and polish. And then I just wipe each one down with this, uh, just a, a soft cotton towel, which you can see now is absolutely filthy because these keys were nasty. Um, all the black keys are the same, so we don't have to worry about those, but uh, there are a t bunch of different types of keys and I just uh, separate them as I clean them. So I just keep them in order, which makes it a lot easier to put the key bed back together. Now I'm gonna turn this around so I have it facing me. Makes it easier to figure out what goes where. You'll notice that there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different types of white keys. There is only one of this CF key and that is the very top key that goes right up here. So we will just put that in. Just put it on, it's fairly simple. You align the front, get the front in, then the back, and then just push it back until it clicks and it's good to go. So we have our high C key there. The next one that's gonna go in is a B and it, ha it says right on there, it says EB2. So we'll fit that one in. The front, back, push back, it's in. Uh, you will notice that I did it wrong. <laughs> you wanna make sure the black keys go in first or else you won't get the black keys on. So we'll put this black key in here first. Here we go. Now you may wanna just go in and just do all the black keys first if you can make sure you get them right. All right, the key beds together with the keys in place. So the next thing we have to do is install the springs. Installing the springs is very similar to uninstalling the springs just in reverse. Each spring has two distinct ends. There's a round part that goes on the key and then there's a hooked part that goes on the frame. You can see the difference between the hooked part and the round part. So we're gonna take the round part with the hook facing downwards, hook it over, that's the key Hold your finger over it and then stretch it out and hook it into the hole. Just like that. I'll do one more so you can see it. So you're gonna, with your needle nose pliers, so I have some very fine tipped ones here. You're gonna grab the hook. You're gonna put, hook the, the loop over the key, finger on top to keep it from flying away. Hook it onto the loop, on, onto the, uh, the frame, just like that. Repeat 61 times. All the springs are back on. Keyboard is functioning. I have to say this, this key bed was absolutely filthy. I'm quite sure based on the condition of what I saw when I took this apart that it has never been apart before. So it was absolutely grimy and filthy. Uh, so I'm glad I got to clean it. As for this retention strip that no longer has any adhesive on it, um, 
Let's see what we're going to do for that. Uh, I think what I will do... I can't do it in here, I'll go do it in the other room, but I'm going to lay this down on a piece of paper and I will spray it with some uh, spray adhesive. That will get it nice and tacky again. And then I can come in here and just put it onto this key bed to uh, keep the keys in place. Because what it does is basically keeps the keys from pushing back that way so you can't remove them when they're not supposed to be removed. Okay, so I've sprayed it with some uh, 3M spray adhesive. I'll put a link to that in the description below in case you care. And uh, now that it's uh, tacky, we can install it back onto the key bed. The idea is that you want it partially covering up these holes so that the keys can't slide back and be removed. Good as new. Key bed's finished. Well, that's it for this episode. We uh, made some good progress. We got the synth apart, got the, the main CPU board out, got the new Kiwi 6 one installed, took the PSU apart, the power supply, put in the, eventually, the new regulator into it and re-soldered all those joints so that they're good and strong. And we rebuilt the key bed, put new key contacts in it. We did not get to the voice board. I think that will be now the next episode. So tune in next week. We'll get our fingers into the voice board, into the real guts of the thing and the really delicate soldering work that we have to do. And uh, then we may get into the controls as well and we'll see if we can, uh, how far along we can get on this project. And as long as nothing else goes wrong, I think we might be able to do it in one more episode. We'll see. As long as I don't uh, break anything else or have any other parts that are incorrect or electrocute myself. <sighs> that was stupid. I've been really excited by all the positive comments I've been getting from everybody. I guess lots of people have these Juno 106s and they were afraid to tear into them and get and, and fix them. Uh, apparently there's a lot of broken ones around, so quite a few people following along to try to learn how to do this so they can do the same thing on their own Juno 106s. If that's you, great. Thanks for coming along on the ride. If you have any comments, questions, anything at all, please leave them in the description below. I read everything you guys write and I really appreciate the, the interaction that, that I've been getting from you guys. Uh, even if it's just take 10 seconds to say, hey, I like your video, or hey, why are you doing this? Uh, I did get a really good suggestion from someone uh, in one of the comments there, something I did not know about, and we'll talk about that in the next episode. So I really appreciate if there's something that I'm doing wrong or something that I don't know that somebody else has done before, uh, that they're passing that information along and then I can pass it along in this video to all of you as well. And of course, if you do like the video, click like because it tells YouTube, hey, this is a video that I like and other people who have the same interests as me, synthesizers, also may be interested in this content and it shows it to them and that's great for me and for them as well. Same thing goes if you like what you're seeing here, you want to see more of it, click on that subscribe and the little bell. That way, every time I post one of these videos, you get notified. All right, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.